So what I'm going to be talking about in this session is graph embeddings. Um, some of you might have joined my earlier talk about uh, machine learning with graphs. This is kind of a much more technical deep dive into one aspect of machine learning with graphs, which is graph embeddings, which is basically a way of representing a graph. So you can leverage that in a machine learning model, deep learning, calculate similarity. Um, I'm Alicia Frame. I'm the lead data scientist at Neo4j. I work on the product team and my role is really to help build out our graph algorithms library and our future data science um, kind of features and roadmap. And then I also work with our early adopters to help them get up and running in production with graph algorithms and actually doing data science with Neo4j. So I'm super excited to share kind of a topic that's really close to my heart, which is graph embeddings. And so in this talk, what I'm going to be talking about is really starting off with what is an embedding? I think often this word is used without people actually knowing what is this, what does it represent, and what can I use it for? And I think the easiest way to understand embeddings is to really start from motivating examples. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start actually by explaining a word embedding because I think we all speak, read, use words. Uh, it's easier to kind of wrap your head around an embedding when you talk about it with something familiar. And then once we kind of have that understanding of what is a word embedding, build on that to talk through a simple graph embedding. Um, once we kind of have that foundation, give a quick overview of graph embeddings, like what are they, what do you use them for, talk about different techniques to calculate them, and then kind of finally end with graph embeddings in Neo4j. And so this talk is much more kind of a state of the science forward looking talk, where are we going next instead of let me sell you something that's already built. So. I like in my talks to kind of have this one like slide where if you're not going to listen to anything else, um, this slide is the one that matters. So what on earth is an embedding? This is something that I honestly struggled with when I first started um, in this space. Um, what is an embedding? If you Google it, you get some very kind of confusing and opaque answers, right? So Google says it's a low dimensional space where you can translate high dimensional vectors. That doesn't help me. Uh, Wikipedia is worse, right? It's a it's an instance of some mathematical structure and another instance such as a group. Huh? The way I think of it is an embedding is just a way of mapping something complicated, a document, an image, a graph, into something simple, a fixed length vector, so a bunch of numbers or a matrix that captures the key features of that complicating thing while making it lower dimensionality or fewer things. So if you think about uh, a word embedding, a word comes out of a book, I have a big thick book, but my word embedding is actually just, you know, 20 digits. So I'm taking something complicated, I'm making it into something simple. Graph embeddings are a specific type of embedding um, where you're trying to translate a graph or part of a graph into a, a fixed length vector. So this is from a deep walk paper, um, you have your graph, you could represent it as an adjacency matrix, right? Um, you have a one hot encoded, which node is attached to which other node. It's a large matrix and it's going to be very sparse. So your embedding just translates that into a much smaller matrix, lower dimensional, that you can then use for some kind of task. And so what we're doing is we're taking, we're learning the important features of your graph and distilling that giant adjacency matrix into something easier to work with. And you might be thinking, well, why bother? You know, you just said, okay, we're gonna do a lot of math to take something complicated and make it into something simple. Or a question that came up in my other talk is, why would I take tabular data, put it into a graph, and then try to make it into a vector? So it's this idea of you wanna translate something complex into something simple that you can use. So the embedding captures the important features of your input object for the task you want to use it for in a compact way. And that representation then can basically represent your graph for some kind of machine learning or deep learning approach. And generally speaking, um, not always the case, but they learn what's important in an unsupervised generalizable way. So when we talk about how do you train a word embedding or how do you train deep walk, you can apply that technique to any context window for the word or any graph for deep walk. And you end up with a custom representation for your use case that's generalizable. So motivating examples. I feel like this is still maybe a little hand wavy, so I like to really get down into the weeds. 
I think word embeddings are the easiest way to wrap your head around what this is. So what I want to do here is I want to represent a word in a way that I can use it mathematically, right? So how similar are two words? And maybe I want to know, can I use the representation of this word in a model? So I want a way of representing my word so I could predict what word should come next or what words are around this word. And if you ask someone, like, what's the simplest way to do this, you'd say, well, maybe I could just one hot encode all the letters of the alphabet, right? So cat is one, zero, one, and then some more zeros and a one. The problem here is this doesn't tell me anything about what the word means, and anagrams would be the same. So maybe that that's probably not what I want to do. Um, or maybe I want to do a hand-engineered rule. So I have every word, and I know something about the word, right? I, I speak English. Um, I know what these words mean, so I could make rules like categories where I could go in and assign weights where I say, well, you know, I want to know that I want to encode king, queen, woman, and princess. Well, you know, are they royalty? I can assign a number there. Are they men? I can put a number there. Are they women? I can put a number there. But this doesn't work at scale, right? Because it requires that I know something about it, and then I hand encode that for every word. So what can I do instead? Well, I could start by saying, well, my words exist in documents, right? So I want to encode cat, right? And maybe I have a bunch of documents that contain a bunch of words. And I can say, well, I bet the documents my words are in tell me something about those words. So I could say, well, you know, I have each term that I'm interested in. And how many times does it show up in a document? And then my word vector could just be, how many times was this word in each of the documents I've looked at? And the problem there is that maybe that's informative, right? It might help me tell the difference between different documents. But I'm going to end up with certain words like is, and, and the. Those are going to be way overrepresented. And maybe words that are actually really important just don't show up that often. So what you can do instead is you could talk about something like TFIDF or weighted term frequency, where I, instead of just saying this is the raw count, I normalize by how often a word shows up. But these still aren't really telling me anything about what the words themselves mean. The first one just tells me, I don't know, which words are in which documents. It might help me tell the difference between documents. Um, and the second one maybe is telling me which words help distinguish documents. But maybe what I really want to do is I want to say, you know, what's the, you know, how is the, what is the relationship between woman and princess? And if I see the word princess, what word goes next? So what I can do instead is I can start thinking about context windows, right? And so what this is, is if you think about it, words exist in sentences, right? And the context around a word helps you understand what it means. So this is just like when you're learning to speak another language or if you run across a word you've never seen before, you use the words around it to guess what it means. And a great example is if you say, well, Tylenol is a pain reliever. And then you have another sentence that says paracetamol is a pain reliever. Even if you don't know what paracetamol is, you see that they're in the same context and they probably mean the same thing. So what you can do from here is you can start looking at co-occurrence, so how often do they show up in the same context window, and specifying a context window. So how far away in my sentence or document do I want to go that I think still has meaning for knowing what this word means? And a simple example on the right-hand side is I have three sentences. He is not lazy. He is intelligent. He is smart. And maybe I want to look at is, and I want to say, well, I have a context window of one behind and one forward. My focal word is is. And then what's what's the context for is? And so I can make a, a matrix where I represent, you know, for every word in all of these, this corpus of three sentences I've created, what word comes next, right? And I can say, well, look, hey, smart and lazy never show up together. I bet they don't mean the same thing. And that's kind of useful. And maybe I could just do this for a lot of words and I'd have this context window and maybe I could use a context window to predict something. So why not just stop here, right? A context window seems useful. It tells me what comes before and what's after. The problem is you need lots and lots of documents to understand context. But the more documents you have, the bigger your matrix is. So if we go back, every document I add, that was three very short sentences. Every document I add is going to add to this matrix. And you end up with a very sparse matrix. So a lot of words don't show up together. How do I handle this? So what you really want to do is you want to take that giant matrix you've created of context and squish it down into something you can work with. And so if, you've, if you're listening to this and you've ever taken a linear algebra class, you're probably like, OK, like when are we going to get to singular value decomposition? Linear algebra knows how to fix this. You know how to take a giant matrix and reduce the dimensionality. So you can do something like SVD. It's great 
preserves your relationships, it's accurate, we know how to do it. The problem here is that it requires a lot of memory and and there, it's not for a specific task, right? Singular value decomposition is how do I decompose a matrix? Maybe I want something specific for what word is next, right? And maybe I can do some optimization so I don't have to pull that entire adjacency matrix into memory. So that's when you get to these predictive methods. So you say, I actually wanna say for every word that I am interested in, I wanna pull out its context window, and I wanna predict something about the relationship between that word and its context window. And so there's two kind of classic models in this space that we talk about. Um, there's SIBO and SkipGram. SIBO is uh, given a context window, what is the word? So if I go back, if I see the quick blank or blank brown fox, what word is missing? SkipGram is I have a word, I wanna know what's next or what was behind it, right? And so they're pretty similar. Generally speaking, a lot of our embeddings are based off of SkipGram just because it performs better. Um, so I'm going to talk about the skipgram model, which is what's behind word to vec That is the, the most common word embedding. Everyone here has probably heard of it. Um, and maybe you've used like a pre-calculated word to vec embedding. This is where it comes from. So skipgram, you learn the vector representation for each word that maximizes the probability that that, that word, what is the next word. So your input vector is your one hot encoded vector of that word. So how often, you know, what is my word? How often does it show up? And then I have a hidden layer, which is where the weights are assigned. And then what I wanna be able to do is predict the probability for every word in my corpus, so my set of documents, that it's the next word. So in this example, my focal word is ants, and I have every word I've ever seen, and I wanna predict what is the next most likely word. And you're probably like, this sounds very specific and maybe not terribly useful. And the cool thing here is we don't actually care about this output layer. What we care about is the hidden layer. So the hidden layer is your weight metric matrix where you take each of those uh, values in your input vector and you're assigning a weight to calculate the output layer. And what you're doing is you're using forward and back propagation and gradient descent to learn what the right weights are. So the hidden layer is a weight matrix with one row per word one column per neuron, and this is what your embedding actually is. So you train Skipgram to learn, you know, given a word, what's the context, and what you take away from that is the hidden layer, and that hidden layer is your word embedding. And once you have your word embedding, the exciting thing is this is your condensed representation of your word that preserves context. So instead of having king, queen, man, woman, and I've done all this work to hand engineer things, or I have this giant matrix, I have a very concise, low dimensional representation of each word as a bunch of numbers. And what's cool about that is it still preserves the context. So the relationship between the, the embeddings of king and queen and man and woman is the same as the relationship between them in the full context. And you can do cool things like look at the distance uh, between different word embeddings and understand how those words are related to each other. So you can look at things like verb tense. So the distance between walking and walked is the same as the distance between swimming and swim. Um, or gender, so king and queen is, king is to queen as man is to woman. You've probably heard these examples before. So they're super powerful. And you're probably like, cool, now I know what a word embedding is, but what does this have to do with graphs? And so the reason I start off with word embeddings is that they're really intuitive, right? I know what a word is, I wanna represent it. With a graph embedding, you can kind of think of all of the nodes in your graph like words, and your graph is like this corpus of text, and you wanna learn what does this node mean? Instead of having a giant adjacency matrix for my graph, what I actually wanna have is a short embedding, just like I had for my word. And so what you can do is one of the first and kind of most widespread embeddings, very simple uh, for graphs is deep walk. And the idea of deep walk is just kind of saying, how do you represent a node in a graph mathematically? And so what this is, is it's basically a simple adaptation of word to vec. So we just walked through the derivation of that. Where does it come from? Deep walk basically says, every node in my graph is like a word and the neighborhood around every node in my graph is like its context window. And I wanna use that skip gram model just like before to predict given this node and its context window, what should be after it. And so stepping through this, what you wanna do is you start by taking every node in your graph and you wanna make sentences for it. 
And so you don't have those natively. So what you do is you take every node and you do a random walk across your graph and you do a fixed number of these. So in this example, I've got four. So I take every node in my graph. I do four random walks of a fixed length. And then I've generated my, my sentences from which I get my context window. Once I have those sentences, I can extract the context windows and then I use the same skip, skip gram model and I learn the weights. And so just like before, the objective is given my input vector, I wanna predict the neighboring nodes, but all I'm taking out of that is the hidden layer. And so the embeddings from DeepWalk or the hidden layer weights from your skip gram model. Um, and I basically have computing embedded computed embeddings that now represent every node in my graph. And this is just one example. So I like to walk through two concrete examples to make this kind of intuitive and hands-on. So you now know how to calculate two embeddings. You could go off and implement these yourselves. There are a lot of other methodologies out there. There are matrix factorization approaches and hand engineered approaches for graphs. Um, just like there's a lot of different ways to do word embeddings. And so that's what this next se section is about. So we understand one simple example. What are they in general? So when I talk about graph embeddings, I think it's really helpful to break it down into different types. And I think you can break it out by what type of graph are you trying to create an embedding for? And the easiest way to say this is, are you using a monopartite graph? So all the nodes in your graph are the same type. Deep walk is for a monopartite graph. And what this is, is you know, deep walk is for a social network, right? Uh, people know each other. So Alicia knows Jake, Jake knows Philip. Um, we're nodes in a social graph. Um, but you could also have a multipartite graph where you have a bunch of different types of nodes. So you have Alicia listens to this song, the song is on this record, this record was produced by this company. And you need to treat each class of node, each node label differently. So you need different mathematics. Um, and this is really applicable to knowledge graphs. Generally speaking, you want to use the embedding that is derived for the graph you're trying to run it on. The other piece that you want to consider is what aspect of the graph are you trying to represent as an embedding? So you could have a vertex embedding, which is basically I want an embedding for every node. So if we think back to walking through deep walk, deep walk was a vertex embedding, right? We're figuring out what's the, what are, how do we represent every node in the graph? Path embeddings instead are basically traversals across the graph. Um, and if you were at my previous talk, I talked about eBay's kind of recommendation path embeddings. Well, one, one thing I've worked quite a bit with is looking at journey embedding. So patient journeys, someone, you have a graph of patients and their contacts with the hospital system. Every patient's contacts with doctors and prescriptions and, you know, physical therapists is a path across that graph, right? Every patient has a series of encounters and I actually wanna pull out that path and I wanna represent that as an embedding to use it to say how similar are two patients' journeys across my graph. And then the kind of the final category is a graph embedding where I wanna take my entire graph and encode it into a single vector. And maybe you wanna do this for something like uh, molecules where every molecule can be represented as an individual graph. Or maybe you have time series data and you wanna say, here's my graph at time one, here's my graph at time two and embed each one. And so the figure on the bottom basically shows you can take a single graph and input and you can find all different kinds of, oh, I don't wanna see that. So I can find all different kinds of embeddings from it. So if I start off with my node embedding, I create an embedding for every node in that input graph. My edge embedding is an embedding for every edge. You can actually kind of combine things like graph algorithms and your embeddings. And maybe you wanna do a substructure embedding. So maybe I go in and I run label propagation to break my graph into subsets. And then I create an embedding for each of those subsets. And then you have your whole graph embedding where you end up with only one data point. Now, generally speaking, when we talk about node embeddings, um, in most embeddings, uh, you have kind of four things that you need. You need a similarity function that measures how similar are any two nodes in your graph. That helps you tell, you know, do is it okay to just use the neighborhood? I have an encoder function that generates the node embedding. And then I have my decoder function that reconstructs the pairwise similarity. And then I have a loss function that measures how good my reconstruction is. So if we think about that idea of we're training our skip gram model to learn um, a vector that represents every word so I can predict 
what word is next, I need a loss function to know if my prediction of what word is next is good or not, right? So every node embedding, kind of generally speaking, will have these steps. So you need some way to embed your node, you need some way to decode your node, and then you need some way of measuring, is this embedding any good or not? Because an embedding that doesn't represent anything about my graph is not useful. Um, generally speaking, you can talk about shallow or deep graph embedding techniques. Shallow embedding techniques are basically where your encoder function is a lookup. So what we've talked about so far with matrix factorizations and random walks, those are just lookup methods. So these are techniques that rely on an adjacency matrix input or kind of neighborhoods. So matrix factorization, you're looking at, I have an adjacency matrix, I want to apply some kind of transformation directly to that adjacency matrix or some transformation of it. Or the other category in here is these random walks, which is what we talked about before. So the random walk is I have every node, I wanna take a random walk from that node, and then I wanna learn some weight to optimize the similarity measures. And these are useful, why not stop here? So just like when we talked about with the word embeddings, the problem with matrix factorization is that you have a massive memory footprint and it's computationally intense. So you're basically pulling your entire graph into memory, you're doing very uh, intensive operations and it's, it's not always the optimal way to go for a large graph. So cool, maybe, so we just use random walks. Um, the, the limitations of random walks is you're getting a local only perspective, right? So we talked about how do I generate my context window? Well, I'm looking at a random walk from each node and I'm looking at, you know, six hops out, right? And when I do this, I'm assuming that similar nodes are closer together. So what do I do instead, right? Let's say these aren't good enough. I want to get more complicated. Um, why would I ever want to move on? Shallow embeddings, generally speaking, are inefficient you don't have parameters shared between nodes. This is a question someone asked me during my last talk of can you use node attributes? And in this case, no, you can't. Um, and you're only looking at generating embeddings for nodes that are present when your embedding is trained. If you're constantly adding data to your graph, you're going to have to constantly retrain your embedding. So newer methodologies actually switch over to compressing your information using things like neighborhood autoencoders, neighborhood aggregation, and convolutional autoencoders. And so this is basically, instead of saying, okay, I either have my full adjacency matrix or I have these specified random walks, I wanna have a high dimensional neighborhood vector. So remember what we were coming up with for every node before, you could think of that as a you know, one dimensional vector. I have a series of numbers. You have a high dimensional vector that represents your full neighborhood around your node, your proximity to all the other nodes, and then you're compressing that high dimensional neighborhood vector into something lower dimensional. Um, this is something like if you've looked at um, any of the VAEs, if you've ever used Deep Chem, um, GraphSage uses neighborhood stuff. These are kind of the more complicated methods. This is basically a preview of where the state of the science is, but a lot of the current work and kind of often what you see in production is based on simpler methods like Deep Walk. So cool, we've gone to all this work to understand what these are, understand how to get them. What do I use them for? When we're talking about a graph, you know, one of the easiest things to do is you can talk about visualization and pattern discovery. So when you have a giant graph that's really useful, it's really cool to explore locally, but how do I visualize my billion node graph all at once? You can lever leverage lots of existing methodologies and you can do things like a T-SNE plot or a PCA, where you basically project those embeddings and instead of trying to look at a billion nodes at once, you can say, hey, an embedded space, all of these nodes are closer together, right? Or you can use those embeddings that capture kind of high dimensional information about relationships with something like, you know, a standard clustering method like k-means that lets you look at both kind of the functional and structural data from your graph. Or you can do one of my favorite things is once you have an embedding, you can take all of those embeddings and calculate pairwise similarity and take your graph or take your graphy data and come up with a k-nearest neighbors graph. So I want to say, you know, I had this social social graph or I had my, my knowledge graph of Alicia listened to these songs. I want to come up with a graph of who is most similar to me based on how what songs they listen to. And I can use an embedding to represent that similarity and quickly come up with a nearest neighbors graph. You can also use these as inputs to your machine learning models. 
Typically speaking, you see like node classification. So I have these embeddings that represent my nodes. I want to predict, you know, is this is this person, you know, male or female? Or I want to say, is this node um, going to buy my product or not? You can use embeddings to predict missing node attributes. So maybe I have a graph, some data is missing, I want to infer it. I can use the most similar embeddings to my node of interest to infer that node's attribute. You can also use embeddings, and this is actually what I've spent a lot of time on historically, is for link prediction. So you can have your embeddings and you want to predict edges that are not currently present in your graph. And you can either use similarity measures or heuristics like we talk about in the graph algorithm space, or you can use a machine learning pipeline to actually build a model to say, yes, there should be a link here based on the input feature of my embedding. And so you can think of embeddings as a way of making the graph algorithm library or graph algorithms in general even more powerful. They're kind of like a special algorithm that is trained for your specific graph, for your use case, and for the thing you want to do. So this is cool, when can I get them, right? This is almost always the next question. Graph embeddings in Neo4j, everyone wants them. And so what we have right now are, there are two implementations that were created by Neo4j Labs. Um, a prototype implementation of DeepWalk and DeepGL. And I didn't really talk about DeepGL today. DeepGL is kind of more similar to those handcrafted embeddings we talked about in the beginning. It uses graph algorithms to generate the features, and then you kind of have a diffusion process of values across edges and some simple dimensionality reduction. Um, these are really proof of concept. So it's, can we create an embedding and what does it look like? Um, neither one is really ready for per production use, but we've learned a lot. So the first thing we've learned is from my first day on the job, I was getting emails of help make this scalable. I want to use this. Um, these prototype implementations were really put together to say, can we do this and what might it look like? So they're not tuned for performance. Um, they're not, they're quite memory intensive. Um, and also the, the limitation here is that deep learning isn't easy off the shelf in Java. So an alternate uh, approach and one thing that we've seen I know we have a graph hack uh, entrant with uh, Pyembio and I know there's a talk from uh, another company who's using embeddings uh, also going on at nodes um, you can use Python to pull your data out from Neo4j and use an off-the-shelf library like PyTorch or Keras or Gensim to train an embedding and we found from our experimentation there that it's really good to get started like it's an easy way of pulling my data out using something off the shelf, but often it doesn't perform at scale due to IO limitations where you're pulling data in and out of your graph, or these aren't really optimized to take use of all of the stuff that we have inside Neo4j. So probably the question you're having is like, what's next? So what I can say is that my team is actively looking at the best ways to implement graph embeddings at scale, and please stay tuned. So this is a forward-looking talk. I would say they are clearly on our roadmap, we're developing them, and we're excited to hear what people want. And so with this, I'm going to stop and pause for the Hunger Games questions and let everyone take some time to answer those while I pull up the uh, Q&A. I think for this one, that I don't have Jennifer on the line, so I will have to manage. I am actually here. Oh, you're here. So maybe yes. I can leave the Hunger Games up while you do Q&A? Yes. Awesome. So uh, someone asked, are the embeddings of any use in climate analysis? I mean, generically speaking, climate analysis would use a lot of high dimensional data, right? You have like geospatial data, image data, weather patterns, time series. So an embedding is a way of representing that in a lower dimensional space. Um, if you're talking about specifically something like deep walk, it would depend on the, the question you were trying to answer and kind of how you formulated that as a graph. So generically speaking, embeddings are useful for almost anything where you have something complicated. Um, whether or not it's useful in the context of a graph embedding depends on kind of your data architecture. Okay, someone asked about um, Dask to parallelize. I don't know if that's a... I don't know what that is, but I would be happy to connect afterwards. Okay, uh, another one asked any ETA on uh, production ready for these? 
I was, I knew I would get that question. I would say, uh, look at six month to one year time horizon. Um, Okay, and then when you mentioned Python performance, is it Python with Neo4j or general Python ML tools? Um, so it depends. So like you can use libraries that are, let's say, GPU compute supported, right? So a lot of the Python libraries are wrappers for C libraries. They're highly optimized. Um, they're very performant. It's really the the reshaping your data in and out where they, they kind of fall over. And no matter where your data is coming from, you're still having to do that IO step. Um, Python itself is incredibly powerful. Um, I've used libraries like PyTorch and Keras in the past. Um, not saying never use Python, I'm saying uh, Python with Neo4j is great to get started, but once you get into the millions, billions of nodes, it, it doesn't scale. And then someone asked, with the embedding performance issue, is it in extracting the data? Would be interesting to talk further. Uh, I would be happy to talk further. It depends on the approach you're taking, um, whether it's extracting the data, whether it's, um, with the example of DeepWalk, creating the, the walks in your graph. Um, you can think about it like there's a lot of, a lot of different points where you can optimize. Okay, and I think that's all the questions. If there were any that uh, were not answered or were missed, uh, please do remember you can sign up on the uh, community site at uh, community.neo4j.com. Feel free to ask your questions there. Uh, and any one of us uh, will be happy to take a look at those. Um, and I think if, if that's it, Alicia, I think we're, we're good. Awesome, thank you everyone for joining.